welcome to the show. So what's been happening? Over in Qatar, the group stage is over and England are through. The clash of the nations. England go through, Wales are coming home. England beat Wales by three goals to nil in the final game of their group, including a stunning free kick by Marcus Rashford. A devastated Wales, outclassed and out of the tournament they'd waited so long to be part of. So how did the Welsh take it? Well, the kids were philosophical. I am disappointed, but Wales did good, but I guess they just better. That's life. <laughs> Adults, not so much. Reaction to the loss? Uh, shit. <laughs> it's absolute bag of wank, mate. <laughs> My favourite reaction was this bloke after Wales lost to Iran. I think for Iran, it's probably their biggest victory they've had since the Iron Sheik beat uh, Bob Backlund at WrestleMania. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Me, I'm nearly as gutted as the time the ultimate warrior lost the Royal Rumble. <laughs> and it could have been different. I mean, it's been so many shocks. What about Saudi Arabia? A huge upset on the pitch as Saudi Arabia beat Argentina. It was incredible. One fan was so happy, he went on the rampage. <laughs> Celebrates like that. <laughs> I love football. I've never thrown my door in the garden. <laughs> Either that or he's misunderstood the phrase smash your back door in. <laughs> Mind you, that is nothing compared to this lunatic. Who brings a gun round their mates to watch the game? <laughs> Just got my shirt, got my... Fl oh, nearly forgot my AK-47. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who's sitting next to me? <laughs> Dave, where's your door? <laughs> Saudi Arabia weren't the only underdogs to win. There's been another World Cup shock for one of the tournament's favourites today as Germany lost 2-1 to Japan. Now... I love Big Cheer over there. <laughs> Not surprised, mate. I love Japan as well. Mainly, I do. And I'll tell you for why. Because a lot of my friends have pointed out that their striker looks a lot like me. <laughs> now... <laughs> but also... I also love them because of what their team did to the dressing room after they beat the Germans. But it wasn't just on the pitch that the Japanese were impressive. This is how the team left their dressing room after the game at the Khalifa International Stadium. All the rubbish tidied away. How great is that? We beat Germany! <laughs> Let's make this place spotless. <laughs> Do you they did chance? <laughs> ba 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 ba, pass the bin bag. Ba 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 ba, <laughs> let's recycle. <laughs> Wouldn't that be lovely? We polished, we scoured. <laughs> Our striker looks like Howard. We're <laughs> Japan. We're <laughs> Japan. <laughs> they weren't just tidying. Look what they left behind. Some rather gorgeous origami swans and a message that said thank you in both Japanese and Arabic. It's amazing. Our team can barely speak English. <laughs> we probably left a note like this. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, my favourite reaction to victory was definitely this. Netherlands boss Louis van Gaal tells his wife she can come to hotel room to get laid. <laughs> How Dutch is that? <laughs> we won, and now we make the sex. <laughs> Look at his face when he spoke to his goal scorer. Nice one, baby! <laughs> <laughs> you just scored for both of us. <laughs> I shouldn't joke, man. Apparently, they made love with such ferocity, they destroyed their hotel room. <laughs> Luckily, the Japanese team tied it up. <laughs> it wasn't just... You were a bit worried then. You're like, did they? <laughs> oh, it's a joke, thank God. <laughs> it wasn't just Van Gogh and his missus in the UK. Sales of adult toys are up 32% <laughs> as World Cup begins. <laughs> that 
That is insane. <laughs> Football's coming home and so am I. <laughs> But to be honest, the World Cup is the perfect alibi for a fiddle. <laughs> Your neighbours won't have a clue. <laughs> They'll be listening in, you'll be like that, yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Stick it in the box! <laughs> oh, 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 that is messy! <laughs> The big story for England, can Harry Kane play the whole tournament? England are sweating on whether their captain Harry Kane will be fit for the next World Cup game. He picked up that ankle injury in the second half of uh, Monday's game against Iran. I think for, for me it looked a bad twist. It's a big concern. It is. Luckily, spoon-bending guru Yuri Geller has lent a mystical hand. Harry Kane is injured. We need him. Uh, back in the squad to play, um, so I'm asking you all to send your positive uh, healing intentions, positive thoughts, to heal his foot. <laughs> that is absolute bollocks. You can't heal injuries with your mind. You don't see doctors like... <laughs> oh, I've shit myself. Besides, if we can heal with our brains, forget Kane. We need to help this man. Oh, this way. <laughs> oh, shit! <laughs> and surely, if we can telekinetically affect footballers' bodies, we'd make our keeper look like this. It wasn't just Geller. Phil and Holly interviewed a man who says his psychic alpaca <laughs> can predict World Cup scores. When did you realise at first that he could do this, that he was psychic? He always gives you this knowing look that, that tells you, I know a little bit more than you do. Does he? <laughs> Does he know what's going on with Bitcoin? Does he know what's going to happen in Ukraine? No, cos he's a fucking alpaca. <laughs> His powers are as useful as this bloke's nuts. <laughs> Alpacas aren't wise. They look like Boris Johnson banged a goat. <laughs> right? A psychic alpaca. I've never seen a spiritualist do that. Is there anybody there? <laughs> What did he say? <laughs> he said... Meh. <laughs> what does it mean? It means you owe me money, love. <laughs> but maybe that's me. Maybe this magical llama does have the gift. So what was his prediction before England beat Iran 6-2? Alpaca predicts England to lose to Iran. <laughs> oh, no, he's full of shit. <laughs> he's dead now. I'm not joking. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> he went on holiday to Saudi Arabia and bumped into this guy. <laughs> In political news, how about this for a massive piss take? Out of the jungle, but no regrets, as Matt Hancock finishes third on I'm a Celebrity. I just wanted to show what I'm just like as a person. Is it a greedy, incompetent prick? <laughs> How? <laughs> How did he come first? <laughs> Who voted for him? Yeah, my grand died in a care home, but then I saw Matt chewing a wallaby's cock and now I love him. <laughs> He's like Diana to me. <laughs> Is that all it takes to forgive him? What about the PPE contracts, the nursing home scandals? I mean, he broke his own COVID rules. We didn't see our loved ones for a year, and he grabbed his advisor like a fucking bowling ball. <laughs> and let's not forget, he's a serving MP. He wasn't doing his job, but he was still getting paid. And who pays MPs? Us! 
What is wrong with this country? Christ, if Harold Shipman was on Strictly, some people <laughs> would vote for him. I know he killed hundreds, but have you seen his Paso Doble? <laughs> MPs shouldn't be in the jungle. They should be working. I mean, have you seen the state of our economy? Tax rises, recession, and the biggest fall in disposable income ever. The Chancellor imposes the highest taxes since World War II. The picture is bleak. That's right. We have the highest taxes since World War II. Think about that. Our government has done the same to our economy as Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and if he was alive, he'd probably be on tipping point. <laughs> We have a black hole of 55 billion, and all Jeremy Hunt blamed was this. These are global factors, uh, partly because of uh, what's happening in Ukraine, partly because of the pandemic. But no mention of the fact that Liz Truss's disastrous mini budget cost the country a staggering 30 billion. Why don't they mention her? That's like me going to A&E with my knob stuck in a Christmas turkey <laughs> and just going, Jamie, bloody Oliver. <laughs> They don't care. They're too busy making glossy videos like this. Today's statement will help deliver the long-term stability this country needs. A stronger, fairer, united kingdom. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> I think most people in Britain feel like this. <laughs> Time for playground politics. In a week that saw the climax of I'm a Celebrity, I thought I'd ask the kids how they would survive in the wilderness. Do you think you could survive in the wild? If you have enough resources, yeah. yeah. What would your resources be? A rifle. A pistol. Yeah. You'll probably want to get active, so <laughs> buy yourself a canoe. <laughs> 17 bags of macaroni and cheese, because that's my favourite. Yeah. And then I will bring a caravan. <laughs> <laughs> a survival tip is carry a straw with grass in it, and then if you want to drink water, if you drink from water with that grassy straw, it turns clean. Is that right? I don't believe that. It, just search yourself. Do your research. I don't believe that. Search yourself. Do your research. Do your research. Yeah, but where would you poo? That is one of the one of the glories of being alone in a in a desert island. You can kind of do it wherever you want. Yeah, but how would you wipe? Use a leaf, but what happens if it breaks? You'll get <laughs> you'll get Nutella all over your fingers. You're not that good looking people. No. <laughs> if I'm honest, if I was stranded on a desert island, I'd probably find I'd dig a hole, I would poo there, and I'd get like, you know, like a frog to to lick me clean. Mm. Yeah. I just gotta go, ah, in it, in it, in it, sorry, yeah, sorry. What happens if the plane comes by? You if know, the plane I, comes by and I'm caught there, I'm, um, that's it. They'd probably leave me and they'd rescue the frog. <laughs> A lot of people are saying that your generation can't look after themselves. Do you think that's true? No, because. I'm able to make a lot of stuff on my own, like cheese and ham toasties. Oh, nice. <laughs> What's your recipe, if you don't mind me pressing? Bread, chop up some cheese and put that on there. Uh-huh. Um, ham. Yep. Another piece of bread. Yep. Use a t um, toaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. Do you think older people are stronger than younger people? Old people, like... They have bad bones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Really bad oh, I've heard that, yeah. I nearly eat and beat your dad up. Did you? Yeah. Wow. I just threw him on the floor after I was trying to pick him up. You Ta might... That's technically what I do. I just grab his leg and he's hopping everywhere and then, and then he just lift his leg up like that and he's gone down on the floor. It feels like I'm having a conversation with two real powerhouses. Because you both lifted your dad up. That's impressive. I can pick uh, my mum up and nan, my auntie, kind of. But... <laughs> Why do some people call people snowflakes? Because they're pathetic and they are sentimental and they can crumble beneath the words of any thing. Say to me that I smell. You smell? A normal person that is tough would go, hey, shut up, you idiot. But a snowflake person would go, cry. Yeah. 
Do you think I'm a snowflake? If we're talking about personality, no, you're not a snowflake. What would I be personality-wise? Mm -hmm. You'd be a slender man who um, asks us the questions and um, talks to little children. <laughs> 30,000 years ago, that we were hunting down woolly mammoths. Yeah, woolly mammoths, toss, impel you. Could stop out your heart. Yeah, blood, blue, blood, blood, ooze, jaguar, big saber tooth tiger, woolly rhinoceroses, and that could, they could all impel you, right? All tear out your guts and flesh and brains and stuff like that, yeah. right? They'd turn you into a rotten carrying corpse, right? Right, right, right? Yeah. And yet, you might be now, you're a snowflake. We're all snowflakes, but I am not a snowflake because I believe in what I just said, and that is what normal people believe in. I'm often lovely. So if you're not a snowflake, what are you? What's the opposite of a snowflake? Well, this is why I asked you the question. It's a snowball, I think. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> You're magnificent. Next up. Now here's a question. Why are the media obsessed with stirring up division over anything? Should we ban parents from cheering on their children? Is it right to remove church pews to help the obese? Is it really time to stop saying mums and dads? There is no place for headbands on babies. SpongeBob is talking a lot about global warming and he's only looking at it from one point of view. Is it selfish to use paddling pools? They're trying to bring race into Ernie and Bert. We're blighted by trans fish. The global tyranny of the metric system. Who knew that algebra was racist? Can the Black Panther be played by a white guy? How do I get pregnant? You go fuck yourself? <laughs> the papers. The papers are just as guilty. Barely a day goes by without a headline like this. French food is an expression of white privilege. Snowflakes think full stops are aggressive and unfriendly. <laughs> Mr. Potato Head goes gender neutral. <laughs> It's relentless. According to The Telegraph, even the word trigger is just too triggering for university students. <laughs> Apparently, they just show this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just the media whipping us into a frenzy. Politicians, you may have noticed, are fixating on this word. It's The Guardian reading. To tofu eating. Woke around. This is about being woke. Lefty woke culture. The capital of woke. The woke agenda. Woke Twitter mob. The woke left. Woke stuff. The woke for the woke. Being woke. Woke! <laughs> Forget about our mistakes. The woke brigade want to cut Postman Pat's cock off. <laughs> it's such nonsense. They're trying to create a culture war where most people don't give a shit. <laughs> Look how few people on the internet are doing this. 12% of voters accounted for 50% of all social media users. It isn't a war, it's a kerfuffle. <laughs> There's five arseholes on the right and five arseholes on the left, and we're in the middle dealing with their shit like a festival toilet. <laughs> Most people don't care about the privilege of beef bourguignon, and yet the papers print this nonsense. Christ, at least in the old days, at least the bullshit was fun. Like this superb daily sport headline. I use Marks and Spencer's vine tomatoes as anal beads. Now I'm <laughs> shitting ketchup. <laughs> but now, the news is just clickbait. I mean, take this story from the sun. Race row over Gavin and Stacey, as some viewers demand it's removed. The race row was actually based on one tweet from an anonymous account that said, Chinese Allen, get that shit banned, get it nuked out of orbit. <laughs> that was it. One tweet from an account with no followers. It's almost like it was a Russian bot trying to spark a fight. <laughs> but then what happens, my friends? Outrage. You get tweet after tweet after tweet after tweet. All that fuss about something that wasn't even real. Who do they think they are? Religion? <laughs> and here's another story that made national news that nobody questioned. Curry branded racist, which was based on one Instagram post. If that's all the proof we need, then after Soccer Aid, Gareth Southgate should take Howard to the World Cup. <laughs> Thank you, Mum. <laughs> You've noticed it. I've noticed it. It's such a toxic cycle. Here is how it works. 
Social media make money by selling your data to advertisers. Ooh. And more data means more money. So they want to keep you scrolling until your thumbs fall off. Ah. And what keeps us engaged? Rage. Facebook's own research found more negative comments on a Facebook post meant more clicks. This is a journalist being bollocked because their last story didn't get enough clicks. The boss patiently explains that without clicks, the paper will go out of business. So the journalist becomes less interested in the truth and instead becomes a rage farmer, turning social media posts into news stories for clicks. They see a divisive tweet with two likes saying Jaffa cakes are transphobic and write a story claiming woke snowflakes want to ban Jaffa cakes. <laughs> the article gets shared by the 12% of people who live for this shit. People on the right blame the left. People on the left blame the right. Everyone starts screaming at each other online. The article goes viral. The newspaper keeps going. The journalist gets praised. And there's only one winner. Then, 24 Hour News gets involved. They bring on someone who pretends to love Jaffa Cakes for money and someone who pretends to hate Jaffa Cakes for money and have a reasonable debate. The left posts a clip online saying, Jaffa Cake lover humiliated on the news. The right posts a clip saying, Woke lunatic gets destroyed over Jaffa Cakes. Everyone gets angry, nothing gets resolved. Then, two days later, we've forgotten all about it because we're all arguing about a news story. Does the national anthem make you want to eat babies? <laughs> it's all a bunch of manipulated bullshit. True. All the papers do it. We can't let the media warp us into this fake fury. And I know it's pretty ironic that I'm getting outraged about how papers sell outrage to keep us outraged, but it's pretty fucking outrageous. <laughs> This is major papers we're talking about. I mean, listen to the founder of Wikipedia talking about the Daily Mail. I think what they've done brilliantly is, in this ad-funded world, they've mastered the art of clickbait, they've mastered the art of hyped-up headlines, they've also mastered the art, I'm sad to say, of running stories that simply aren't true. And that's why Wikipedia decided not to accept them as a source anymore. Think about that. Wikipedia says the Daily Mail can't be trusted. <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> the same Wikipedia who published that David Beckham was a Chinese goalkeeper in the 18th century. <laughs> Robbie Williams eats domestic pets in pubs for money. <laughs> and Benedict Cumberbatch is an actor who is half human, half otter. <laughs> he is, of course, a meerkat. What I'm trying <laughs> to say, don't get sucked into all this. Most people don't care about aggressive full stops or Mr. Potato Head's clit or what... <laughs> or what... Or what curry Gavin and Stacey. They'll happily call anyone by the pronoun they want because they don't want their pronoun to be prick. There is no <laughs> culture war. It's ten fucking people and a dying media trying to make money by keeping us divided. That is all it is. Welcome to the final part of the show, and it's stand-up time. Please welcome the fantastic London Hughes! Hi! Hi, guys. Hi. I'm good to see you. I'm London Hughes. I'm really funny. Um, <laughs> I just want to say I'm an international comedian. Some of you may not know that I'm very famous, but I'm very fucking famous, but... <laughs> I currently live in America, in Los Angeles. Um, thank you. I moved there February 2020. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fun fact. Wouldn't recommend moving to a country run by Donald Trump two weeks before a global pandemic and a race war. Like, <laughs> it was fucking insane, guys. And I survived the race war, OK? And that's... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, white people, for clapping that I survived the race war. <laughs> Thank you so much. The thing is, that wasn't even the worst thing about living in America. The worst thing about living in America is the fucking chocolate, OK? <laughs> American chocolate is garbage. It's star spangled depression. It's disgusting. <laughs> it tastes like someone who once had a dream of chocolate tried to recreate it using cardboard, sugar and capitalism. It's terrible. <laughs> it's fucking disgusting, OK? It is the worst thing to come out of America since Bill Cosby. I'd rather eat Bill Cosby. I would rather eat Bill Cosby than lick 
literally <laughs> eat American chocolate. And you guys are so smug in Britain with your British chocolate. So fucking smug, OK? You try going for a race war without any dairy milk buttons, all right? <laughs> Seriously, George Floyd died, I couldn't even get a fucking Maltese up. <laughs> Crazy in America. That's not even the weirdest thing. The weirdest thing about living in America is the fact that I am single <laughs> living in America. I know, I'm so gorgeous. But <laughs> I'm single living in America and it's hard for me because I'm looking for love. And then you have to realise that I'm looking for love in a country where 8% of the people own passports, but 33% of the people have herpes. That's a reality, <laughs> OK? It's hard. It's hard, guys. Think about me, OK? It's hard to have a hoe phase in a country with no free health care. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's really hard. I'm trying to fuck my way to the top, but I can't afford it. <laughs> America's crazy. It's weird. It's, weird. It's, it's a dangerous sport having unprotected sex in America. Seriously, it's dangerous. I live life on the edge, OK? Fuck bear grills, bear back grills is what they call me. <laughs> OK? That's the life I'm living. It's hard. It's hard. It's also very weird because I'm a black woman in America, but I'm from Britain. And most Americans have no idea that black British people exist. Seriously. <laughs> they have no idea. Whenever I speak, they're like, what part of Hogwarts did you appear from? <laughs> like they, they have no idea. They're so confused. The white Americans don't know whether they should be racist to me or not. <laughs> they're like, well, gosh darn it, you look black, but you sound white. Like, <laughs> It's fucking crazy. They don't even call me Black British. They call me British African American. <laughs> or my favorite, female Idris Elba. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. America's weird. I love it, but honestly, moving there has changed my whole life. Seriously. I'm, I'm living there, living my best life. I've sold movies, I'm starring in TV shows, I'm working with my Hollywood heroes. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Thank you for having that. It's true, I am, mainly because everyone thinks I'm related to Idris Elba. But, <laughs> but there's a lot of talk since I've been away. I've been gone for a few years now, and there's talk in the UK about females in comedy. A lot of people are saying that British comedy is sexist and there's no love for the women. But I can now announce I am officially the first British woman to have a Netflix comedy special. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And all I had to do to do that was do stand-up comedy here for 12 fucking years, watch <laughs> every single one of my white male mates become famous comedians, and then move to a country where the police are legally allowed to shoot me. Thank you, Brim! <laughs> I've been London News. You've been amazing. Everyone have a good night. Love <laughs> you! It's time for Good Deeds, and an amazing woman who was crowned best teacher in the world. Here is why. I can see you. You're lying there. You look at this. It's beautiful. That's not That's mine. OK. <laughs> OK, I'm trying to find a positive thing to say. Hi, I'm Andrea. I'm a teacher, and I run the organisation Artists in Residence. I have been an art and textiles teacher for the last 18 years. In an art classroom, young people just find themselves. You don't have to be able to speak fluently. You're able to express who you are through the power of the arts. I passionately believe that the arts are for everyone and it's vital that we bring them to all backgrounds and all cultures. In 2018, I was nominated for the Global Teacher Prize. There were thousands of applications from all over the world. We were informed that we were going to be going to Dubai. It was just so surreal. Then Trevor Noah mentioned my name. Andrea Zafiraku. And then uh, I won. <laughs> I won a million dollars. I know, I know, I know it's nuts. I won a million dollars. That was mine to keep if I wanted it. Do you know, my mum said to me, I knew you wouldn't keep the money, I knew you wouldn't. And then somebody said to me, well, you know, what is it you'd like to do? So I used the money to start the Foundation Artists in Residence. The whole point of Artists in Residence is to bring the artists into the classroom so that young people can see how the creative industries is a really strong profession to have after they finish their educational careers. 
We have got professional musicians, animators, ceramicists, sculptors, theatre directors, just doing such an amazing job in inspiring young people. Can you just see, I'm just going to very carefully draw around the profile. Just jump up. I've been running art workshops in schools for about 25 years now. Andrea is a lovely person and I think it's amazing that she has started Artists in Residence. I've been able to go to so many schools which have made such a big difference to children's lives. That looks excellent. Are you pleased with it? Yeah. I've never done some of these stuff before and just trying it has improved my art and made me want to be an artist. Some people don't have the opportunity to do stuff like I'm doing today. So I think everyone should have the chance to try something new. Make them larger, the numbers, the, the letters. Miss Safra Kid made the lessons fun and interesting, and she kind of let me express my feelings even when we were just doing like a simple lesson. We know that the arts make people happier. The more we do in these types of communities, I think we will have a happy future ahead for everyone. If you are a school in a highly deprived area, please do contact us because the sessions will be free. If people would like to support the charity, they can donate on the website. We'd be very grateful to receive their support. Lovely stuff. Thanks very much for watching the show. Good night, my friends. Good night.